photograph that was taken during one of the early starvation periods in, in the Soviet Union where about three million peasants died it was a picture of a peasant couple standing behind a table at a market selling human body parts for food it's like, and you know, I have this weird quirk which I don't think does me much good, but maybe helps me understand things better when I see that someone has done something extreme I learned to do this a long time ago when I worked briefly in a maximum security prison I try to imagine what I would have to be like, what kind of situation I would have to find myself in to do that and believe me, man, that's a horrifying, inter that's a horrifying enterprise because it is actually possible no matter what it is that you read about someone doing and no matter how unlikely it is that you think you would do that it's possible to imagine yourself in that situation and that well, that's enlightening, that's what I would say, that's enlightening you know, because one of the things about enlightenment is, is that you get enlightened by doing things that are necessary that you really, really, really do not want to know don't want to do and imagine, imagining yourself as a perpetrator of that sort is that tells you something about the world and it tells you something about human beings but it's a hell of a thing to swallow you know, in, in a very well structured society like ours where we're so peaceful well, because we have the heat and it always works and we have electricity and it always works and we have plumbing which is a bloody miracle and it always works you know, it's just one of the things that this imagination process has done for me is keep me alert to the absolute miracle that my life is every day it's horribly cold out there you can't grow any food you die if you're out there for 24 hours if any of this infrastructure was unreliable for any length of time we would be in serious trouble and it's never unreliable it's so unlikely and so here we are with all this reliable infrastructure and because of that we don't really have to compete with each other much I mean some you don't compete for food you don't compete for shelter or some people do but not very many so it's really easy to think of yourself as good because well, you're not doing anything nasty to anyone but you know a cynic might say well that, that's just because you don't have any reason to but those reasons have arisen many times in the past and in fact, they're the norm, not the exception we're the exception this insanely functional society that we've somehow managed to generate is it's incomprehensible to me that it exists so anyways back in the industrial, the end of the industrial revolution you know, the conditions of the worker were pretty brutal I mean, George Orwell wrote a book called Road to Wigan Pier, which I would highly recommend, it's a great book and he went up in the 30s I think it was the 30s to work, to live with the coal miners up in northern, in northern UK and those poor guys you know, they had to crawl to work for two miles down a tunnel that they couldn't stand up in just to start their shift and then after their eight hours of you know, hacking away at the coal walls which is rather difficult and dirty and dangerous and of course you get black lung from it so it's also fatal and of course they didn't get paid very much so after doing that for eight hours then you crawled back your two miles and you didn't get paid for that, that was just, that was just the commute and the housing for those people was not good, the food wasn't good, most of them had no teeth by the time they were 30 you know, I mean, being poor was no joke, even in a place like the UK, which was relatively well off and so there was every reason to be concerned about the disparity between rich and poor and poor is the natural state, you know, that in the western world in 1895, the typical person lived on a dollar a day in today's dollars and, you know, that's not uncommon in many places in the world now so there were reasons to be concerned with inequality 
and you know, the Russians took one pathway inspired by Marx and we took another pathway inspired by John Stuart Mill and John Locke and the English tradition, I would say, of democracy and competed for 70 years and things seem to have worked out better here but it was a hell of a competition and there were real differences in opinion at the bottom of it and those two systems turned into armed camps and that's not over exactly, you know, I mean there's the Chinese, although they're a hybrid now between communism and capitalism and hopefully they're more interested in getting rich than they are in, you know, having a war greed is a good motivator, uh, surprisingly enough, it's kind of reliable but anyways, by 1989, <clears throat> the jig was up it was obvious that the Soviet system could not, was not functional there was no, there were no consumer goods, that's for sure even in the main department stores in, in, in Moscow and people just kind of lost faith in the whole project you know, it became, ha, huh, for a while, I don't know if you know about the show Dallas Dallas was a soap opera that ran at night, a serial and uh, it was about these rich Texans who lived, you know, a 1% lifestyle and it was the most popular show in East Germany the streets would empty so that people could watch Dallas well, when you're sitting in your horrible Soviet architecture flat that, you know, you had to struggle to get with your informing relatives because one out of three people in East Germany was an informer, a government informer and you watch Dallas, you know, there's a little cognitive dissonance occurring and so, it fell apart and quite peacefully actually, you know, there was a war in there was a bit of war in Eastern Europe but it fell apart remarkably peacefully, and so here we are and we don't know what to do with the pesky Russians but at least there's no evidence that there are mortal enemies for fundamental reasons of axiomatic presupposition and things are a lot better in the world despite what everyone tells you than they were 40 years ago, and they're so much better than they were 50 years ago that it's absolutely staggering we've lifted more people out of poverty in the last 15 years that have been lifted out of poverty in the entire history of the world before then people are gathering economic resources at a rate that even the wildest optimist really couldn't dream of speeding up so it's not like we're without our problems, but so during that period of time I was obsessed, is a good word with a question, and the question was why would human beings produce two camps and then produce a massive arsenal of hydrogen bombs and I don't know what you know about hydrogen bombs, but they have atom bombs for triggers and you know, that's worth thinking about, because an atom bomb, you know, hey, that's that's something but a hydrogen bomb, that's the sun that's really something so, and you know, there's 20, they were at, at, at the peak of the cold war, and there's, this is still true to some degree there were literally tens of thousands of these weapons aimed at the Soviet Union and at the West and that was enough to pretty much put an end to everything and that's a dangerous game, man you know, and not only because of intent, but also because of the possibility of accidental just an accident, you know just, just a mistake, or just someone who's a little crazier than you might want them to be you know, and you might think, well, no one would want to bring about the destruction of the world, but that just means you don't know very much about Stalin because of all the people who lived in the 20th century who had power Stalin was the most motivated to bring everything to an end um, there's some evidence that he was murdered by 
Khrushchev and his crew, and Khrushchev was the next leader and if he wasn't murdered, he was at least not provided with medical attention when he was dying and uh, there is reasonable evidence that he was gearing up to invade Western Europe and he didn't really care how much destruction would go along with that I mean, he'd already killed tens of millions of people he had a lot of practice, he was good at it it didn't really bother him, maybe even enjoyed it so what the hell, that's what I thought, how can it be that we are doing this, it's so insane and so then I started to think about belief systems, you know because you could say that each camp had its own belief system, the one in the west was derived it had a very lengthy history, de derived from the Greeks and the Romans and the Jews and the Christians and, and from various schools of philosophy and from the Enlightenment and all of that and then the Soviet Union was basically predicated on a rational philosophy that, that opposed the axioms that the West had evolved and each group organized their societies around that and, you know, I took political science for quite a long time and the political scientists and the economists they basically thought that people competed over resources um, but that wasn't a very good answer as far as I was concerned because it wasn't obvious to me why people valued the resources they valued there was, the economists just assume that there's resources that you value but, you know, people can value a lot of different things it's, it's not exactly fixed I mean, you tend to value food very highly if you're hungry, obviously but, you know, there's lots of things that we value and that we want that seem somewhat arbitrary somewhat like a decision so I got more interested in why people valued things and what it meant to value something and then what it meant to believe something and then how it could be that someone could believe something so deeply that they would risk their own death to protect it or at least risk the death of other people and, and maybe on a massive scale like, man, people are committed to their, to their system now, you know a system of belief is not just a system of belief, that's one of the things that I came to understand is that it's not appropriate to make this too psychological people defend their belief systems, but that's not exactly right, you know we have a shared belief system well, it's sufficiently shared so that here we are we don't know each other, we're a bunch of primates we're in this room, and it's peaceful, and no one's scared and, and that's pretty amazing, and that means that we're all acting out our roles so, we're acting out our roles, and we have an expectation with regards to those roles and those two things match and that's the important thing, and we'll talk about that a lot it isn't the belief system, or the integrity of the belief system even it's the match between the belief system and the actions of the other people within the belief system what you want to maintain is that match you want to act out your beliefs in the world and you want what you want to happen that's a good thing, you get what you want and you validate your belief system great, perfect, security but a lot of that is, if we're interacting, even right now there's a whole set of expectations that are governing what we're doing like, you don't want me to take your, your little tablet there and smash it that would be shocking, right? you wouldn't know what the hell to do right, you'd be somewhere different if I did that and you wouldn't know where you were and that's another thing to know, because that's a fundamental difference there's a fundamental difference between knowing where you are and not knowing where you are I, I think it's, in some sense, the fundamental difference you can think about it as the distinction between explored and unexplored territory but you have to I don't know if you've ever taken a cat to a new house cats hate that and, because in their old house, and maybe in their old neighborhood they've slunk around, you know, at the edges checking everything out they start out afraid they check everything out, they know where to hide they know, where to, they know, they know, they know what, what's safe and they know that because they go somewhere and nothing happens, and so then they assume that it's safe and they slowly build up a neighborhood that they're comfortable with 
my dad used to take the dog for a walk and then the cat got lonesome and so it started to follow him and first of all it would just